All right, so what is this? Our second lecture in chapter three, and we only have one homework problem, problem five due today, but it doesn't look like her. We could talk about that if you like, but you asked a question about solving problem 18, so we're right. going to go back. I didn't know how to use plot. Right. Uh, right. Let's do this. Uh, let me emphasize that on March the 22nd, the day after spring break, um, we're going to have a guest speaker. Uh, Shannon graduated from UTSA and is working for Carrier. And so she'll come and talk about chillers. So it should be a... So now let's jump over to an Excel file. So this is my solution for problem 218. Let me kind of go through this. It was one shell pass, two tube passes. You, you had the hot water uh, shell side. Uh, cold was the oil and the heat capacity rates and everything I calculated. So for part A, you basically had to calculate what was the area, about 125 square foot. Did you get that? No, yeah, close. I mean, you want to compare some numbers. How about the effectiveness, 71.2%? And then uh, yeah, the equation uh, to calculate the number of transfer units had a step in between, and then it calculated the number of transfer units. Did you get about 194? Uh, yeah, 1.9. 1 1 well, that's going to be the difference then between 1.9 and 1.94, uh, I believe, because the area is you just take and unravel the number of transfer units. Let me write it out over here. NTU equal to UA divided by C min, right? And so the area is equal to number of transfer units times C min divided by U. And so this equation right here is is the, um, well, I don't like it just covered up what I just typed, didn't it? Put it down here so we can see it at the same time. Paste. All right. So the area is the number of transfer units. We calculated 1.94 times the C min, uh, minimum heat capacity rate, or 18,000, and divided by U280. So it comes in at uh, that many foot squared. Okay, yeah, so you got it. Now part B is where you shift uh, gears, right? So part B for the problem, let me see if I can color code this. This is part A up here. And they basically, now you fix your area. Don't change your area. That's the starting point of part B. So the area is fixed to be I, I left it there, 124.8, blah, blah, blah. You, you could round it off to 125. Here, I'll put 125 as my area. We're changing the mass flow rate of the hot fluid, aren't we? Okay, so if I come in and change the mass flow rate of the hot fluid, that'll be changing this green cell over here. So it's left at 18,000. That was our beginning point, wasn't it? But if I come back and I come over to this cell and I say let's 9,000, one, two, three, then I can not worry about the part A solution, it's changed, right? But I'm trying to stay on the same sheet. But the area is fixed, the minimum has now changed, the ratios changed, the number of transfer units changed because I changed the M dot of H. The effectiveness, I get updated, um, and then I calculate T hot out, which is different, and T cold out, which is shown. Okay, So they were asked to plot what happens if I change the uh, mass flow rate of the hot fluid, how does the temperature of the hot out change? And so um, what I do is I, I set this up for data in, in Excel to go under the data tab and go under what if analysis and use data table. Have you done that one? 
it's a little clunky and every time I've got to figure out, okay, what do they mean by that data table? But um, you start with an anchor cell up here, okay? So it's like an, in this table I'm going to have a sequence of values that I'm going to be changing. Put that, I like to put it in a column going down, okay? But the, right above it, it's the cell of what is my anchor, my anchor cell. So that's really the output that I'm interested in. Where does this go and grab? It goes and grabs T hot out from part B calculation. So I'm about ready to automate the calculation of a T hot out by doing what? By changing an input parameter that goes from 1,000 to 3,000 to 5,000, 7,000, all the way back up to 20 something. Where did we stop? 39,000, I think. Did they ask us to go to 39, or where did they ask us to go? How much? 24. Only 24. So this is the stop part. So let me color code this. And I just changed this so I could shorten it to show you, because otherwise it went off the table, or off that sheet. So let's color code that to be something there. So my anchor cell is uh, something more pronounced and it's going to grab this number right there. Um, notice that I put in here this 9,000 and that 9,000 gives me back 130 which is the anchor cell's value because it's sitting at 9,000 but it, let me change this so you see Let's put in uh, 7,000, 7, 1, 2, 3, and that will give me a T hot out of 116.6, that my anchor cell value is updated, and you can come down here to 9,000 and, and uh, no, 7,000, 116.6, so it's 117. See, so these, these temperatures are the same, so you kind of see what they're doing. Okay, well, what you do is you highlight your data table. The first one is your anchor cell up in that upper corner. I just have one thing that I'm burying but the table could have multiple um, columns. It could have more than one column. But we go under data and we go under what if, we go under data table. And this is the challenging part because I will have to play with this to make it work because I always forget row input cell. What is my row input cell? I have to select that and then my column input cell. What I think is, is my column input cell is this guy and let's see if that works. Cannot change part of a data table. Man, I don't know why my data table, I want to get rid of this stupid data table. Okay, fine. I think I know how to do it now. I have to get rid of this data table that I already had created. I'm going to copy. I'm going to temporarily paste. I'm going to blow this whole thing away. Delete. Goodbye. Now I'm going to do it again from scratch. I'm going to say my anchor cell is right there. It's T hot out. The data that I'm going to be varying is I'm going to vary from 1,000 to 24,000. I should have cut that, shouldn't I? Control Z. Let me do this. I don't really want that sitting there anymore. Cut and paste. Good, it's gone. And uh, this one, I don't know why, but I think I just have to do that again. All right, now I come in here. It's a clean slate. Haven't tried it before. Data table right there and it says that column input cell I'm changing is that's the, the mass flow rate of the hot fluid. <sighs> Does it look like it worked? Seven, at 7,000 I should get about 117. It comes in right here at 117. It worked. So instead of me rerunning it 25 times now I have it ready. Now I can come over here and I can grab these two cells and I can plot. And I plotted already, but I probably destroyed that plot. So this was uh, water flow rate, and this is the temperature water out. 
and then you could tell I did it earlier over here where I'm doing the temperature cold out okay so the cold is the oil and the uh, temperature of the oil out is as a function of the mass flow rate so I plot them but all you do is, is darken those two and then say insert plot uh, where's my plot? This one? Maybe I'll do it that way. And there. And then I cleaned it up a little bit. So, data table. This is why I use Excel so I can get things to plot. So, for the uh, zero mass flow rate, does it, did you, you didn't do it? Like I didn't do it. Gave me a weird like yeah. Yep, I would avoid it. I know it says from zero up to, but it's not going to work too well at zero because there's nothing to transfer the heat. So I wouldn't go. Right, right. So I think my minimum was 1,000, right? So sorry, I didn't go below that. Can we go to your NTU formula? This NTU formula right here? This for this case it was five. If I change this, it may change what three thousand one two three. So the NTU right here is changed. If I want to go back to the original problem, mass flow rate of the hot fluid was was it eighteen? Mm -hmm. Eighteen thousand. So now part A makes sense. Okay. So this is if you're looking at the NTUs for part A, this now makes sense. And I think I tried to use the formula that was in the book. But you could use the formula out of any heat transfer book. Yeah, right. You could just use another good heat transfer book. All right? Is it okay that I approximated by the table? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you bet. Um, let's jump back to here then. And we're marching through heat exchangers, so let's get into it. Um, last time we talked a little bit about a shelling tube, and we solved that problem. A lot of heat, trans heat exchangers are what we call cross flow. And uh, here are some examples of cross flow heat exchangers, just like you would expect. Fluid may go inside the tubes, and then another fluid crosses the tubes. The tubes can be finned. Here they're finned by circular fins. Or here, what type of finning is that? It's like a plate, plate fin. But the flow is, they're crossing each other. We're going to analyze a heat exchanger like this to solve a problem. Then we're going to also look at some compact type of heat exchangers, which um, are cross flow, but um, they're a little bit different geometry. Actually, this is very similar to this one, isn't it? So it's just showing you the header getting into the the um, tubes and then the plates between the tubes. Let's solve this problem. You have a cross flow heat exchanger. It uses a given surface 9.29 0737 SR. You think marketing picked that or engineering picked it? What do you think? I think uh, marketing didn't pick that one. That was picked by engineering. <laughs> okay. This problem is in your textbook. So what I thought I'd do is this is a little more challenging chapter. So this is really example 3.1 in this chapter, or 3.2, one of those examples, OK? So if you have your book, you can follow along. So we're going to have aluminum tubes and copper fins. And so it's going to look something like the tubes are going to be made of some material. What do we say, aluminum? And the fins of another material would you say copper? Okay. Um, air at a mean temperature of 150 and a pressure of 1.38 flows at a given velocity in the exchanger. And water, so we have there's our two fluids, water at 30 psi A and 90 degrees flows through the tubes. Ah, so the water is inside the tubes and the air is flowing over the fins that are connected to the tubes. And they give us enough information about the water velocity, the air velocity, 
uh, air mean temperature that helps us re um, get our fluid properties that are a function of temperature. Uh, pressure is given, pressure is given. Probably the least useful piece of information. Well, it's useful in the sense that you know that, hey, at 30 PSI, water's in liquid state. But if it changed to 60 PSI, it really wouldn't affect the answer, would it? Because density of water is not a function of pressure, it's incompressible. And so it's, it's nice to know this one, but it's not that big of an impact. What about the 1.3? If they said, no, it's 2.38 atm, well, it's going to change the density, isn't it? And if it changes the density and you're given a speed, it's going to change your mass flow rate. So it's more significant. All right. Calculate the product UA. They're trying to get you to tell us the overall heat transfer coefficient with an appropriate area. So just lump UA together and do it per one unit meter or cubic foot volume of the heat exchanger. This is a little confusing when it's per unit volume of the heat exchanger, but it would be just like going back here and saying, you know, give me a volume of this heat exchanger. And I could have multiple tube passes and a lot of fins and probably the information on that heat exchanger, this cross flow heat exchanger, this numbering right here tells me that. So we flip through our textbook and we look for the information on that type of cross flow heat exchanger. And these are the numbers that match. It's a finned flat tube. They're not circular tubes, they're flat tubes. So this is the cross section for the water to flow through the tube. And there's going to be multiple of those passages, and so they call it a flat tube. All right. Then, then the fins are uh, like this. They're connected up. Maybe I should change color to that. And so out of the textbook, they try and show you a zoomed-in section of it. But in the original Kays and London uh, handbook or textbook that they uh, pull a number of these figures from, it's, uh, did I say K's in London? Yeah, K's in London, compact heat exchanger. Uh, text, um, this is the, the illustration, and it's a little hard to see, but you can see right here, that's one of the passages for the flat tubes going through. And then what's connecting it? Those fins, those plates, which act as fins. This right here, what are they showing you here? Side view. It's a different view. And so here is the passage for the fluid, the water, and then here are the fins. You have to have really good eyes to read some of this because it's just really, really challenging. Okay, before, well, let's go ahead and take a look. You can go out and you can find other people who have cataloged uh, this and described it. And this is the best that I could find out there for a good illustration. What they did do, unfortunately, is they changed everything to millimeters. So I have to change back to inches, but that's fine. All right. And it's off of some F-chart uh, website. Ease is some software. I think Dr. Creamy wants to get it here. He's used to get it, used to have it here. I think Dr. Ali wants to have it here. That's great. It's just who's going to pay and who's going to pay it after another year and after another year and after another year. So you can probably buy as a student a uh, student version of Ease. And I was impressed that they went in and they tabulated and they have a big library of all the compact heat exchanger data. And so this illustration shows you a little better. So here again are those where the water in this problem is flowing through. And then we have the fins. The fins are like this. And the flow of the air is going to go that way, isn't it? Cross flow. They give you a lot of the properties. Also, what about this one? What's, what's happening? What are they showing right here? The fin isn't just straight. It's got kinks in it, right? So it, as I go down that passage, that direction, It'll be kinking back and forth just a little bit. What are they trying to do? 
promote heat transfer on that gas side or that fluid side that's going in those passages. So, so um, the, it's, it's being kinked by this much at this spacing. And so the flow is going to be going like that. Okay? All right. Um, what is the, this is the pitch, the fin, the fin spacing, pitch, etc. What, are, what is the information that they're giving me? What's on the x-axis of this plot? What's on the x-axis of this plot? It's the Reynolds number. That's exactly right. And now, what's on the y-axis of this plot? And there's really two plots. Isn't there two curves? There's two curves. And so this upper curve goes over here, and it's plotting whatever that symbol is. Give me your best guess. Friction factor. And it's the fanning friction factor. OK, not the Darcy Wiesbach. And then over here, what are they plotting? You can kind of see it. Let me just blow it up. It's H over G C sub P number parental to the two thirds. Well, this is the convection coefficient, G mass velocity, mass flux, specific heat. All of this right here is the Stanton number, which is Stanton number, which is, I worked it out or asked you to work it out last time or time before, Nusselt over Reynolds Prandtl. It will boil down to H over G C. And then this is a funny way to write it, but they multiply by Prandtl to the two-thirds. It's like the number with the subscript Prandtl to the two-thirds. This was done a number of years ago, right? Most textbooks use, wouldn't write it that way, but this is grabbed off of that old textbook. So um, I know that they use the same scale, which is nice. They don't have to break the scale, but it does fall where F is of greater. And then this basically is sometimes they'll write this as J sub H, the Colburn heat transfer factor. How's your vocabulary? Pretty good? A lot of new words, right? Stanton and G and Colburn. Okay. So uh, what are they doing? I have, I have convection on the inside of the tubes, and I have convection on the fin side. What is this F, and what is this stanton prandtl number, you know, or the Colburn factor, apply to? Which side? Well, which one's the easiest if you said, I need to predict the heat transfer inside and the pressure drop inside? It would be inside the tubes, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. That's what it would be. So on the outside, the fin surface with those little kinks, that's the hard side. So basically, this data is for that side, flowing in between those fins in that cross flow direction. OK. Now, before we leave that, so what, let me do this. How would I use this F? Well, if I'm looking at my heat exchanger and I have the tubes running like this, and then I have my fins running like this, and my fluid flow comes in and goes from here to here, basically I can use this cold, not cold, but fanning friction factor to get the pressure drop. How big a fan am I going to need to push that air on that side? All right, how about here? This will give me the convection coefficient on the outside. True? All right. Let's take a look. Fin pitch, 9.29 per inch. So per inch, you have 9.3, 9.29 fins. All right. You can then figure out um, right up here, I don't know if I, that is the pitch or the thickness of the fin. The thick, thickness of the fin is, is very thin. Oh, what is the thickness? T, 0.004. You have very good eyes. Where did you see that? Oh, the third down. I was looking up here. But right here, the thin, uh, thin metal thickness, 0.004, and it's copper, as it was stated in the problem. Okay, how about what's this information given? 
slow passage hydraulic diameter. Why do they always give it as 4 R sub H? Because that's D sub H. It's the hydraulic diameter is 4 R sub H. And they give it to you. How about this one? The total heat transfer area per total volume. And it's alpha. Is that the heat transfer area for the wetted inside the tube or that the air sees? with the air seas, with the air seas. You're going to have to calculate what is the area that the, um, is the, for the heat transfer that's uh, inside, okay? Let me see if I have it. That's for the air side. And you could do the same thing for the water side and I forget what symbol that they use for that, but on the water side, you'll get that the, um, the, vol the, the area for the heat transfer on the water side divided by the volume of the heat exchanger, think about one cubic foot, is 42.1 foot squared per cubic foot. So for one cubic foot, the air is gonna blow over a surface area of almost 230 square foot and the water is going to blow over an area of 42. Okay now what about this the fin area to the total area? Well we're going to use a fin efficiency the air blows over both the, the tube which it can directly contact as well as the fins so that, that the air blows over the 81.4% of it is a fin area, and then one minus that is the bare tube area. Does that make sense? There's a lot of information on these plots. Okay, let's take a look at uh, a few more things. What's this right here? They're telling you they didn't put the label down here. They're trying to save space, but it N sub R, Reynolds number. But they multiplied by uh, 10 to the 3 to get back to the number that you want. So if it, right here at 2, that's a value of 2,000, isn't it? Reynolds number. And this is about, uh, I think that's a, isn't that a point? Is there 1.5, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, anyway. Uh, now, think about that Reynolds number. Do you think that this is all turbulent flow on the fin side or, or the air side, or is it possibly that some of it's laminar flow? Yeah. So the Reynolds number could be where you're getting into transition or laminar regime. It's a low. It, they're covering some low values of the Reynolds number. Okay. Let's do this. How are we going to solve this problem? Well, what exactly were we asked to solve for? UA. Well, if I wanted to calculate UA, usually I think about UA, 1 over UA is equal to 1 over the area on the inside, area of the inside. What was on the inside? The water side. The water. So you can think about the water. And then I would think, well, you can do the resistance, the conduction through the tube, okay, um, that is going to be the thickness uh, divided by um, K in the area of the tube, and this is for the wall. Now, that was aluminum. It was aluminum, right? The, the tubes are made of aluminum. And the tube wall thickness, that my memory says it's 0 0.001 inch. Let me see if I can find it on this diagram anywhere. No. How about on this diagram anywhere? Hmm. No. Maybe it was just covered in our textbook. They're repeating a lot of this information right here that was in the other uh, illustration. Makes it a little more readable. 
All right. Uh, plus, then what do we have? 1 over h on the outside. And then we're going to have all of that area that the fluid contacts. It's the fin plus the bare area. It's the total area that the air contacts flowing on the outside. And then if I have some efficiency of the uh, overall area. So it's maybe you put, the, put uh, h a total on the outside multiplied by the overall fin efficiency for that fin surface. And there it is. That equation makes sense? All right. This is a term we, we suspect is going to be negligible, but we can include it and then make the comparison. Oh, you, yeah, it's probably better just to think of it as you conceptually, you cut it and stretch it out, and you have a thickness. And then the, the area is related to the perimeter and the depth going down in the axis. Yeah, you approximate it. All right, how do we find the convection coefficient on the inside? Just what's the recipe for doing that? Yeah, so we're going to be looking for to unravel the Nusselt number on the inside, K over some D hydraulic, isn't it? Because we're going to base our Nusselt number on hydraulic diameter. All right, what type of correlation would we like to use for it? Well, you can use a couple different correlations. The book. Um, does not like to use that one that I showed you, which I think has been reported to be a little more accurate. It just likes the default to Adidas Bolter. Really easy to use. Real easy to use. Okay. So for the Adidas Bolter, you, you have uh, the, the Nusselt number based on hydraulic diameter is 0.023. Reynolds based on hydraulic diameter to the 0.8. Uh, Pranel to the 0.4. Um, What's happening to the water? It, it comes in at 90, right? What's, the air has a 150 degree. Isn't, it, isn't the water being heated? And the exponent on the panel is 0.4 if it's being heated. OK. So what is that uh, Reynolds number um, on the, for the fluid flowing in? There was three equations, rho, v, d over mu. Great, everybody remembers it, but what about the 4m dot over pi d mu? Or which one using g? Which was it? It was g over mu. And so the, the d sub h is, is known, d sub h was 0 0.01352 foot. Mu is for our uh, fluid. It's 1.52 times 10 to the minus 4 uh, pounds mass per foot second. And I need to know G. Well, what is G? G is rho V. And so the density, what, 62.1 or 62 point something pounds. And then the velocity is uh, 4 foot per second. So that's how you calculate H on the inside. Do I get that it's 1,353 BTU per hour foot degree F? Foot squared degree F? So that's the H on the inside. OK. That's on page 216 of our textbook. Now, what about this term? That was the easy term. We've got to get H on the outside. How are you going to get, and before you get the uh, fin if, uh, overall uh, efficiency, you've got to get the area of the fin overall, you know, the overall area that the air sees on this side. And the way to do that 
is to go back. What are they telling you in this parameter alpha? They're telling you if I have one cubic foot, the air sees a heat transfer area of 228 foot squared. So what you do is you say, I'm going to either leave it as a variable, the volume, or just pick a volume, pick volume to be one cubic foot. If you pick volume to be one cubic foot, then the area overall that the air sees is 228, isn't it? Foot squared. So it's like, okay, got that one. But remember now we're doing everything on a one cubic foot. Okay. Next is how about that convection coefficient H on the outside? That one. How are we going to calculate that? Well, we went back to this and use this information to help us calculate the area on this plot somewhere is the information to help us calculate the H. Do you see it? Isn't that this group right here? Right? And so that's that uh, Colburn factor. So what I need to do is I need to calculate the Reynolds number for the air side. True? Once I have the Reynolds number on the air side, somewhere in here, I come up, up and I read across, and I get the Colburn J factor, then I unravel the J factor to get the H out of it. Okay. How do I get the Reynolds number? Well, they give me, this is for the water side, right? Is G for the air side equal to rho of the air times the velocity of the air? Up. This is the velocity of the air, isn't it? 30 foot per second. I just get to get the density at that temperature and that pressure. So I get the density of air at 150 degrees F and 1.38 atm. Multiply it by the 30 foot per second. Now I have G. Once I have the velocity, mass velocity of the air, I can calculate the Reynolds number of the air. Is that G D of H over mu? And what is my, I may have just messed that one up completely. This hydraulic radius right here is for the air side. The hydraulic radius for the water side is different. Hydraulic radius for the water side, 0, 0.0. 0306 foot. I'm sorry about that. That's for the water side. Could you just calculate that from the diameter? Or yeah, right. So the hydraulic, uh, go back to this illustration right here. If I wanted the hydraulic diameter for this passage is the hydraulic is the diameter hydraulic equal to for the cross-sectional area divided by the wetted perimeter let's do a quick check here um, yeah they don't really make it easy to see it but can somebody tell me what is the distance from here to here Yeah, I think it's visible from right there. Can you see that number? 0.737. It's from the outside to the outside. You're very good. All right. Now, I do think that the thickness of the aluminum tube is 0.01 inch. All right. So I take off 0.01 on this side, 0.01 on that side. So effectively, its long, its length is 0.707 inch. That's how long it is. How high is it? All right. Well, it's 0.1 from 
outside to outside, but the, for the flow passage, it's 0.1 inch minus 2 times 0.01. So isn't the inside passage 0.08 inches? All right. With that information, 0.08 inch and 0.707 inch, I know that I'm approximating it as a rectangle. Give me the cross-sectional area. If you have a calculator, please calculate it. And then give me the wetted perimeter. And then give me the hydraulic diameter. And then compare it to the value that I said we need for the hydraulic diameter, which is, uh, oh boy, they, they, they didn't even give me the hydraulic diameter. They gave me the hydraulic radius in foot. Let me get rid of this. Is it four, approximately four times 0 .00306 foot? See how close you get. I'm going to pause. All right, so I need to apologize for making the error before. This flow passage hydraulic diameter that's reported right here is for the air side in between the fins. All right. Now, you need the hydraulic diameter for the water side, what's going on in the tube. But that's straight out of our heat transfer textbooks. It's, it's the four cross-sectional area over wetted perimeter. And then we just did a little work. We said from outside to outside, it's 0 .70, 0 0.737 inch. But our aluminum tube has a wall thickness of 0.01 inch, hence you take it off, and the flow passage has from side to side 0.707 inch. The same thing for the height. The outside to outside is 0.1 inch, take off 0.01 inch for top and the bottom, and it gives us a flow passage of 0.08 inch. I know it's elliptical or it's a flattened tube, but we approximate it, just to get a good estimate of the hydraulic diameter, to be uh, 4 AC over P. The, the, the area is 0 .07, I mean, 0 0.707 times 0 0.08, and the perimeter is 2 times 0 0.707 plus 2 times 0 0.08, just approximate it as a rectangle. When you do that, uh, you calculated that its hydraulic diameter comes in at 0 .01198 foot. And the text reports this is the appropriate hydraulic diameter, 0 .01224 foot for the flow passage. So it's pretty good, right? We're close enough. We'll stay with the textbook's value. So we go back over here. We have the hydraulic diameter for the air. This was incorrect here for the water. The water, we needed to use that value. Point. That's not right. Clean this up. The hydraulic diameter for the water, 0.012 roughly foot and this was mu so then that feeds back into Reynolds number etc this one comes off of the illustration the hydraulic diameter 0 0.01352 feet right all right and now you have the Reynolds number for the air side you come over here I want to know J what did we calculate for the Reynolds number around 3300 Right, there's, here is 3,000, so somewhere in here. What do we pick off for a J? Looks like it's 0 .007. Actually, they, they, uh, it's, they give it to us as 0 .0069, and that's embedded in, on page 215, about a fourth of the way down, top line, 0 .0069. They just don't call it J, they call it H bar divided by G C sub P Prandtl to the two thirds. Okay, now you get the H. Get the H. 
and the H for 25.3 BTUs per hour foot squared degree F. You have to get the overall efficiency. There's a little bit of work there. When you get the overall efficiency, uh, you use this illustration. You had to calculate this parameter, and overall efficiency comes in right at about 90, what, 92%. So there's a lot of work to get this 92%. But now we have all of our pieces, don't we? For calculating that. Let me see if I had this also in Excel. I'm sure I do. So that was for our air side, right? The one we're just struggling with. And the... Efficiency is 92%. The overall efficiency of the fin surface, knowing the area of the bear, is 93.5%. You have that area for the heat transfer, and you calculate H times defectiveness times the area for the air side to be 5,432 BTUs per hour degree F. On the water side, let me just highlight this. It's kind of like the bottom line of that equation. On the water side, we did a lot of work. And you have H times A is larger. It's 56,800 and blah, blah, blah. If you do the tube wall, the tube wall thickness is 0.01 inch. And you get the circumferential perimeter length. And it, it, it basically comes in pretty small. 4,955. If we put those three things together, I'll have the, uh, where did I put them together? Yeah, right here. I'll have the resistance due to the water side. That's 1 over HA on the water side. Resistance to the wall, resistance convection, the air side, 1 over HA. And you sum them up and then you take a little back check and you say, what was the percent of the overall resistance due to the water side? 9%. Through the wall, negligible. Through the, for the air, it's still 91%. Even though it's, it's thinned and you have a lot of area that the air sees, it's still what restricts the heat transfer is 91%. All right? There's a lot of work. You've got to grind it out, but I tried to follow the text. Let me do this. Now let's talk about a different type of cross-flow heat exchanger, and I'll just introduce it. You can have a fin surface and a plate and a thin surface. So especially if I'm trying to transfer energy from air to air, but you could have it goes through this channel, which has some material that is finned that goes back and forth, and hopefully well thermal connection to the cover plates. Likewise, the other side, the hot side, could go this way. Well, you can see that the outlet hot temperature will have been reduced more here from the inlet than over here because you're seeing here the cold of the cold as it's coming in. So same thing for the cold on the outlet. You will have some non-uniform temperature variation in that outlet profile of the temperature. Well, how do you make these things? I think I showed this before. You have a fin surface. You have some sidebars and two plates, and those plates hopefully have good thermal contact with the fin surface. Not only can you put one together, you could put multiple together, true? So here is the plate. Here is some bars on the ends to help seal it up. And so the flow on this one here would be going that way. And the flow would be going that way. And then you could put multiple layers. So here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. And then it's hard to see, but there's another passageway. They could be different height. You could see that this one has a lot greater height than this one. It's a lot shorter height, a lot shorter. You can also see they have different thin between them. What's happening in here 
it's like uh, these are rectangular fins, but they stop and then they're offset. So as it flows, it's going to be like, oops, you know, it's offset. And it's, oops, it's offset again. Uh, I'll show another picture of that, but that is trying to augment the heat transfer. Break it up. Increase the H. Are you going to pay a penalty for pressure drop? Yes, you are. And then this one has like triangular fins, but what do they have right here as they move down? Instead of just being a smooth surface the whole way, they, they stamped it and kinked them out. They're called louvers. What's that supposed to do? Break it up. Break up that boundary layer to, to promote the heat transfer. Are you going to pay some pressure drop? Yes, you are. So this was, a, I think, a pretty good illustration. So what you can do is you can bring in the air and have a manifold where it comes in and shoots across each of those passageways, shoots one time through, and then the other fluid comes in and shoots across those passageways as well. And the, then it would be transferring the heat between the hot fluid and the cold fluid. Well, you could also do this. You could have it pass through, turn back, pass through, turn back. So you could have multiple passages instead of just a single pass through that cross flow heat exchanger. So what's happening in between? They try to put some thinning between the two plates. This is the simplest. It's just a triangular fin, just like that, between the two plates, and it would be long. Now, what about that one? It's a plain rectangular fin. So you can see how they would make that. They would press it, and there you go, and then put a plate on, plate on, try to braise it or solder it some way to get good thermal contact. Then you could have a wavy fin. Well, what they did here was they have like a triangular fin, but as it moves back, it's not, you know, it's, it's wavy. So the flow passage is that way, but as you're trying to go in that passage, all that's trying to do is promote the heat transfer. Okay? Because you know that if I have a heat transfer in a straight run of pipe, but then I have that pipe and I do a U-turn, and then I have the straight run of pipe pass, what about the H right in here? The convection coefficient on the walls right in here. It's higher than the straight run. Okay, that's what they're doing there. This is that offset strip, so it's like kinked and offset, and so they're breaking them up as they try to go that way. And one more, this is heavily louvered, so it has multiple louvers on that fin to promote the heat transfer. Well, this is a problem. I don't think I have enough time to start it, but I'm going to talk about it next time, and I promise to do a better job. How's that? So I've got to take a look at our homework that's due because I don't think we're ready to solve this problem 11. I know it's Tuesday, but we have to do something. I don't think we're ready to solve it. Okay? So um, delay. Delay. And if you didn't do problem 5, do it now over the weekend and turn it in. All right? So this one's delayed, and those have a second chance if needed. If you got it in, great. If you did half of it and you didn't write quite finish five, go ahead and finish it and turn it in uh, next time we meet. And if you just were overloaded by another exam, another class, and you didn't even get to five, here's your second chance. All right? So thank you very much.